Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the Center of Justice and Law Spotlight Conversation Series, where we talk to guests about health, justice, and law. I'm Father, and along with Parker, we are both students in the Health, Justice, and Advocacy class this semester. We are also partnering with the CGL. Today, our Spotlight Conversation will be on refugee, immigrant, and migrant health, and our guest today is Sadia Youssef. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. You That's have fun. so much you have so much experience in health and human services. You work at St. Mary's University of Minnesota in healthcare um, as an instructor for healthcare and human services. You work for the DHS specifically in the ISCA and EDB program. Can you tell us a bit about, you know, and you've also worked as a program director both locally and internationally. Can you tell us a bit about the work that you're doing within the community um, and how it connects to refugee, immigrant, and migrant health? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Hondo. And thank you, Parker, for inviting me today. I appreciate uh, you uh, giving me this platform today. So uh, right now, I currently work for ISCA, Inc., and we work under EDB program for DHS, and we do early intervention, uh, early intervention. So EDB stands for Early Intensive Development and Behavioral Intervention uh, for uh, the children uh, that have autism and related conditions. So what we do is we educate, train, support parents and their families. Uh, we, know, we promote uh, participation uh, in the community within family schools. We improve uh, you know, quality of life of people and their family that have those diagnoses. So we do early intervention uh, providing medical necessity for early intervention uh, to support uh, so that uh, uh, the individual can stay within their community. So staying away from, you know, um, you know, somebody being in a nursing home or so we're doing our best to make sure everybody uh, can go to school, can stay within their community and their home, and they can do activity of daily living with maybe partial or little or minimum assistant. So that's what we do uh, as of uh, what, how does it link to the community that I work? Uh, uh, I work for, this, for East Africans, any, uh, any, any person that have a kid on the spectrum of related fields, uh, we educate them on the signs and symptoms and what resources are available in the community. Uh, we educate them. We we try to eliminate stigma around, you know, uh, disability and neurological disorders, and uh, we just try to advocate as much as we can. Yeah. So, <clears throat> thanks so much for sharing a little bit about the work that you're doing. Um, our, the other question we have is: How have your own personal experiences within the healthcare system? helped you connect with refugee and immigrant populations when working with ESCA and the EDB program? So I surround myself with policy, programs, practices, knowledge, initiatives that are out there that are supporting immigrants and refugees. So that is how I, I, I survived and connecting with the community is having one step ahead and understanding what policies are there, what practices are there, what programs are there, the knowledge, the science behind it, and, and all that. So, yeah. Awesome. That's great. How do you overcome hurdles in the healthcare system, like within language and cultural barriers in your, in your work? We try to find resources. Uh, um, you know, uh, we, we try to see uh, connecting the links uh, sometimes the systems don't work together. So, you know, trying to do holistic treatment kind of approach where we're like, okay, so this client will need this, will need this. So who who's doing what and connecting on behalf of coordinating for the families, trying to see how can they do one-stop shop? Like how can they get services plus application for everything they need? And who can we connect them in the community that are doing what they're looking for or what they need? So we kind of make it a uh, specific need to specific families because every family is different. Yeah. So making sure that, you know, 
we get them access to the resources that are available for them and educate um, them in the process of you know yeah. what they need and the reason behind why they should need this you know that also makes me wonder is it easier to connect with families um with children since you come from a similar background as them it is uh there is that trust because we're speaking the same language we can laugh at the same jokes uh we love the same food um you know we kind of have the same you know starting point of knowledge of how i was raised you know what jokes we can make around uh within our families so the so they it's easy easily trustable when the person looks like you smells like you you know dresses like you and so i don't work so much as the trust because the trust is already there because they can see similarities and so yeah. they know that you know and i i'm always up front explaining that i'm there to support them and that clarifying who i am uh it's very important to uh explain uh that you're not there to get their children you're not from immigration you you're just there as a as a person to support them on their uh as you know to give them a path on how they can better themselves within the community mm-hmm. so they don't find you threatening them or you know just removing all that assumption aside as the moment we meet mm-hmm. explaining what i do and and how i can help them and that who i don't affiliate myself with so yeah I really like how you explained how like community is such an important part of your work and how like that plays a role in connecting and um bonding with the people that you're working with. Do you have like a particular story or experience that really stands out to you um in terms of like bonding or connecting with the communities that you work with? Yes, I'm always telling uh individuals that I train employees that uh, don't start doing the work. for example you're here to teach a parent about you know neurological disorders on your first, you know trying to learn and understand the parent learn to understand the person you're serving you know get to know them you want to give to them and so uh giving that space where you just get to know each other first before you start beginning and trying to understand what is their basic need for now what do they need for example you might go to somebody's house and they might have not slept two nights because they have a, a tooth pain and so the first thing you do is first help that parent with making an appointment uh getting them to a dentist before you you begin teaching them about neurological disorder or how they can help their child what resources were lacking when you were going through the like when you were navigating through the health healthcare system yourself and like how do you now fill in those gaps um how do we fill gaps is is always advocating uh you know trying to work through policy makers and policies around healthcare the need for you know including healthcare in every sector uh so we all participate and assist uh in advocating for healthcare uh knowledge and you know resources and grants and you know always considering why health is important in the community uh you know trying to tailor it to specific communities because every community has specific needs you know um we might have you know unhealthy eating that's relating to diabetes uh because our cultural food is based on carbs and so ha- you know having more educational i think it's it's special it's it's making focus to each uh community on what they need and what they they they're suffering from and what you know we cannot create grants or policies that is you know fits it all it doesn't work like that in healthcare because each community is is dealing with specific things can you think of any specific resources that are there to help communities uh 
you know, there is so many nonprofit, for profit organizations that assist in healthcare or, you know, the, the first step is getting somebody, uh, you know, enrolled in, you know, uh, Minnesota care, uh, getting that application out and getting them, you know, do yearly checkup, preventative health, you know, maybe somebody has not gone to a healthcare checkup for years. So, so there might be things that we can prevent before we do the cure. Yeah. I also liked um, earlier when you were talking a lot about how advocacy is really important in your work. And that really connects to the work of the CJL and the work that we're doing in um, our health justice and advocacy class. Yeah. Um, are there any like specific um, ordinances or like laws that have really helped um, like immigrant communities that you've advocated for in the past um, or anything that we should be aware of now that we could possibly be advocating for? I know Minnesota Department of Health has uh, uh, has included a policy on, it's called Health in All uh, Policy. Uh, it's H-I-A-P. And there is also CHIP, um, Health, uh, you know, uh, Minnesota Department of Health also grants that also are given in terms of, you know, physical activity, uh, grants that support, uh, healthy eatings and all that. So there is always, you know, when, when policies are made, there's a lot of advocacy work so that policy, the right amount is given to, you know, the right need to the community that needs it, kind of. Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit about your journey to EDB and ISCA? Like what led you to work in the field that you are like currently working and investing in now? I love working in this department, uh, in this area. Uh, actually, my my um, my dissertation is also in this area. Um, you know, families, immigrant families with kids on neurological disorders. Uh, I'm passionate about it because I see there is a need. There is a gap that needs to be filled. And, uh, you know, all, all the work that I do, I'm doing it for the community that I belong to. So, because I, I believe in charity starting home, uh, I want to uplift my community first and assist in this gap and this need that I see uh, that first that they don't understand. And uh, sometimes there is no language or a translation directly to how to explain what it is. And, uh, there is, uh, you know, financial barriers. There is uh, climate barriers. We're, we're more from a tropical place in, in Somalia. And, and as you can see today's weather, it's neither cold nor hot and it's snowing and, you know, even the mood, you know. And so just getting used to the different, even weather changes is, is a barrier. Uh, always trying to find a translator, you know, sometimes yeah. that, cannot translate fully what you're saying because he mm -hmm. has they have to find words that can translate what you're trying to say yeah. and so there's the cultural barrier also you know that we have to overcome and there is the assumptions and stigma around it uh, and our, around mental health and you know and preventative care and you know we have to put in context you know what does culture say about it you know do you only go to the doctor when you need to, or do you go because you think you're going to get something? So we have to do knowledge, uh, training, and education for our immigrant families and refugees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned that there's like some stigmas within like healthcare, and um, you were kind of mentioning how that can affect different communities, yes. um, especially the communities that you're working with. Yes. How, how do you guys work to remove those stigmas um, and work to um, create a more equitable system in healthcare? Talking about it, adding in stories, uh, we're more, uh, we are, uh, we're nomadic, we have nomadic behavior. So uh, the more stories we talk about, you know, the more stories we tell about, you know, what had happened was, there is an imaginary person, you know, so including stories and mental health and how the system has helped this person or, you know, how this 
person did not get in trouble with the police because of the actions that, you know, so creating this, these narrative stories around mental health, that it's okay that this person got help and, you know, they survived and now they're raising their kids and, you know, they're more healthier, happier, you know, they're not struggling with sleep, you know, uh, you know, they, they, they have somebody to talk to that's confidential, that does, your family would not know about it, you know, that it's you and your therapist, what you talk about stays in that room, you know, that it's, it's legally binded that we don't talk about what you say to your relatives and whoever asks us about you. Uh, and so just explaining the rules and regulations and policies in place when, you know, talking about mental health and how doctors, you know, how we work, how we conduct services and, you know, what their rights are, you know, so that they know yeah. their rights. You talked a little bit about like language barriers. And I know that in Somali, there is no word for autism. Uh, so how would translators kind of navigate that? I know you talked about that before, but it's kind of interesting how you said that translators have to come like, like describe with words something that we don't have a word for in our own language. Yeah. So I, I try, I try telling everybody that, um, don't translate autism as a crazy person first. They're just unique and different and they learn different. There's nothing wrong with being diagnosed with autism. Actually, I try explaining most of the famous people that we know are diagnosed with autism. You know, Fortune 500 CEOs mostly are autistic. You know, uh, anybody with a beautiful mind uh, that invented something is on the spectrum. So explaining what an, a spectrum is and that, you know, you know, sometimes I, I, I'm like, you know, everybody might be somewhere on the spectrum. Uh, and so w they learn different. They might need a reputation and, and therapy and, you know, and so explaining that it's actually a gift and, and, and not a deficit. It's actually a strength. Once we we know what this individual is passionate about, so we can tailor their education, uh, their uh, their everything to what they what they love doing, like computers or, or gaming or accounting or mathematics. So we can actually they, they can they can do better than regular regular people if we know if we assess and we pay attention to what motivates them to to do things so yeah yeah that's such a beautiful way of like describing it and i think it just shows how like it, something might not be specifically like easy to explain but like by having not just one word for something it opens up just like a world of possibilities as well i think that was so amazing to hear how you how you work to describe that yeah yeah thank you thank you can you tell us, um, you worked as a program director both like locally and internationally. Can you tell us a bit about how your experiences like internationally compared to, you know, working locally within communities? Culture shock. I mean, I mean, uh, going to another country, working in a different environment and, you know, they might have different policies in different sectors in different countries. And so learning different policies that would not make it here. Uh, so uh, different policies, different environment, different way of seeing things, uh, you know, ethical, moral standard, I think is the big thing. Uh, so yeah, the difference is huge. Uh, but as a program director is, we focus on overall project productivity of development you know like are we meeting what we said we're doing you know are we following the rules is the funding supposed to be the way it is uh, do we need to allocate things and move things around what needs to be done is the project going to be met on time on budget you know so we kind of look at the overview of the mission and vision of the agency and uh 
And so we just try, everybody stays in their lane and that we're meeting expectation that is needed. I know you mentioned like the budget right now. Uh, is, is there like maybe a sense of kind of like a frustration of having like a limit in terms of like money when dealing with um, in a, a topic that's, you know, so important to you and that you're like, you're so passionate about? Like, how would you make that work? Well, uh, you just have to be creative, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, creativity and innovation comes in, you know. Uh, uh, you just, yeah, it's just, it's just like, I, I believe it's just like, you know, when you're cooking, you know, you just cook with what you have and create a meal out of it. And you can never have enough money to do everything you need on, in healthcare. You can never have enough time to do everything you need in healthcare. You still have to sleep and, you know, and rejuvenate, you know. So being creative and doing in the innovative things around healthcare, I think that's, that's what will help in the future and now. Yeah, I, I really like how you talked about taking time to rest and taking time to rejuvenate yourself because I feel like in order to do advocacy work and healthcare work, like you first need to take care of yourself and the people that mean the most to you. What kind of things do you do for fun or just to prevent um, burnout in your role? Like how do you take care of yourself so that you can take care of others? For me, uh, I like to spend time with my kids. Uh, awesome. I would like, I, I love reading children books uh, to my kiddos, uh, reading it over and over again that I know every page of it. <laughs> um, just, you know, uh, giving time to somebody who needs time, just somebody who needs somebody to listen to. Um, so balancing you know, life, work, personal, professional, uh, parenting, uh, all requires time. And whenever moment I can get, I like to sit down and drink coffee. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Like, I feel like when we're talking about like healthcare and advocacy, it's usually like, how do providers help the community? But I think on the, on the flip side, how has the community impacted you in some way? the people that you're working like with or for? Um, when, I, when I see parents and kids who were doing much better than when I first saw them a year ago or six months ago, meaning they have improved both their knowledge on the disorder, competency, they're resilient. And, you know, uh, the the parent is glowing and happy and knows how to communicate with her child, knows what foods to avoid, you know, where to get, you know, sensory stuff. Um, she giving me advice or telling me when sensory day is at the museum. Uh, so I giving me more knowledge than I, you know, and, and sharing with other parents what she found or what he found to be helpful for their for their kiddos. Uh, you know, exchanging knowledge, exchanging coupons. Uh, so just when I see the family is able to find resources on their own, it makes me say, aha, I've done my work. Uh, now I can move on to the next family. So my job is just to teach how to navigate the system and how to find resources for their kids. Yeah. I think it's so amazing how you describe like even just sharing information or resources with one family and seeing how just like tight-knit tight communities can spread that information to just like a friend or, or another community member and like it's really cool to see how information and resources can spread in that way and I think you're doing such an amazing job in your role to to make that happen. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, so another um, one last question we have is we're just wondering what can community members do to uplift the voices of immigrants and refugees? Um, and do you know of any like volunteer opportunities or volunteer opportunities within EDBI or other organizations that advocate for the needs of immigrants and refugees? Yeah, get my contact from uh, Hodo. 
if you need volunteer hours or volunteer places, I, I have so many. Uh, in my program, we need volunteers. We need people who want to do community hours, uh, students who want to do internship. Uh, so we're always there to support academia and uh, people who want to get into healthcare. We need people who will take over when we retire. You know that. Uh, yep. So we do. I, I love volunteers. I love people who want to do their capstone or internship. Uh, we do have spaces for them uh, to work in our uh, ISCA Inc. Yeah. So we're kind of getting near the end of our time. So we were just wondering if you have, uh, this kind of ties into the last question, but if you have any like calls to action for our audience or any like last things that you want to um, leave with our audience or, or have us lift up. Policymakers disturb your, 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 your senators and your uh, representatives about health and mental health awareness and, you know, funding and education and how can we, you know, come into the table, um, you know, creating a platform where people could uh, talk about their needs, specific needs to specific communities. Oh, can you can you repeat that a bit more? I think we can't hear you a bit. Can you hear me now? Yep, yep, we can hear you. You know, I, I think, you know, coming to the table, advocacy, creating a platform for people to talk about mental health, uh, removing the stigma, starting with your own family, maybe discussing about mental health and how they view it. What would they do? Is it okay for them to to their family and friends and say, you know, um, I need help. Or what would you think if a friend comes to you and says, you have a mental, what is your assumption? Starting with yourself first. What are some of the biases that you might have? So because once we know that, then it's already half of the solution is done. When we know how we see things, what can you change with yourself? Within yourself to remove your biases around you know, neurological disorders or mental health or families uh, that have shown some kind of empathy and kindness. Whenever you see a kid screaming at Target or top food or don't give that parent the eye, they're struggling. You know, I have seen so many people just giving the parents, you know, like, hey, you're not doing a good job or something. And uh, that kid might be struggling with something neurologically. And it's not because of that parent. Thank you. That's so. That's some great last words to leave our audience with. Um, we just want to thank you again for your time. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. It was a pleasure getting to know you and hearing about your work and um, hearing about how you're advocating for immigrants and refugees. Um, and just a message to our audience, be sure to follow our Instagram and Facebook um, and tune in for our next spotlight next week. Um, it's going to be surrounding sexual violence, art, healing, and activism. Um, so thanks again for tuning in, and thank you for joining us. Okay. You guys did great. Thank you. Bye.